It is Wednesday afternoon, May 25th, and we are picking up approximately at verse 18 in, in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 5. We have been looking at the uh, genealogy here and finding some interesting facts. If I review it just quickly, just very shortly in our minds, and I don't even have uh, in front of me what I thought I had to do that better. Here we go. Um, let me just remind us that this is the pre-flood time. Yeah, I don't have it, so I'm just going to go with what I've got. Sorry for the rough start. Um, they lived much longer. We saw in verse 5 that Adam is going to live 930 years on this earth. Seth, verse 8, 912 years. Enoch lives 905 years. This is not the Enoch that was translated, uh, that was taken into heaven without... Um, physically dying first here on this earth. Canaan, 910 years. Mahalalel, 895 years. Now we'll pick up from there in verse 20, but we've got an Enoch here in verse 18 that we're going to be looking at. We have, and, and starting with verse 18, we have Jared, or Yarod, lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch, or Hanuk in the Hebrew. That name means dedicated. It's believed that he was dedicated to the Lord. This is the seventh generation from Adam. When we looked at the seventh generation through Kion, through Cain's line, and I'll remind you that was in chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, we saw that it went, and I'll just say the names in English for sake of time, Adam, Cain, Enoch, different from this other Enoch, Arad, Mahuyael, Methushael, and Lamech. Lamech is where the recording of Cain's line ends, and Lamech was very ungodly. Lamech was the one bragging that he had killed people, he had killed at least two, he killed in self-defense apparently at least one of them, so he felt justified and vindicated and felt that he should be protected even greater because of the reason, but his, his whole demeanor is full pride, full of himself, he even sings a song of his his ability to kill these who had come against him. What a difference to come to the seventh now in Adam's line through Seth. Seth is the, the godly line that will continue on, that will go all the way down through Mashiach. Seth in verse 3 of, of chapter 5, we saw his birth, and his name meant appointed one. We looked at the fact that his mother Eve, Chava, who named him, probably thought he was the very redeemer, he was the appointed one. Well, he wasn't the appointed one to redeem the human race. That's not going to come for a long time, which she was unaware of. But he would be appointed in, in the sense it was him, it was he, I guess he is the better English, that God was raising up who would, um, who would be the line that would carry on down the Messiah. Sorry, I'm seeing a delivery coming to the door. Pardon the interruptions. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you. We'll just leave it there. That's great. I thought they had to come to the door. Okay, so um, if we go from Seth to a different Hanok or Enoch. This one meant mortal frailty. Seth realized life is fragile. The human being is fragile. We all need to recognize our frailty and that our weakness is where the Lord can be strong. But uh, obviously, he was looking at something more than just a physical weakness because when they're living 900 plus years, and we'll see what, how long Enoch lived shortly, if I didn't already cover it, um, I don't remember right now, but anyway, his life isn't cut short. So it's not that he was sickly and he died, but obviously mortals are frail spiritually. And that's where, where to look, is to realize he is seeing, okay, there was his, before him, Cain, who ends up murdering Abel. We see as we go down the line, we get as far down, we see the other murders and all that are taking place. But obviously, there was a struggle right from the beginning of the spiritual versus the earthly, the, the fleshly, I'll call it that. It's not that it took time, that everything was almost like the Garden of Eden. And, <coughs> and, and slowly but surely, it got worse and it got worse. No, it was bad right away. You've got murder right away. You've got, you know, all of this. We saw when um, Cain went off, the city he built. We saw all of this, you know, the pride of man is all the way through that line. 
So we see right away there's that battle, that spiritual versus the flesh. And that's what I think we're seeing in his name. And it would have been Seth's way of drawing attention to the fact we need to get right with our God. We go down from, from Anach to Canaan in verse <coughs> 9. Canaan, the name means smith. It probably was like a blacksmith. This would have been one that, that's saying, see how we're carrying on. It makes me think either he or his parents maybe weren't as spiritually minded <coughs> as Seth. You know, don't know. We're just reading into that. But by the time we get Mahalalel, verse 12, the next generation, or the next, you know, progeny, the next uh, sunborn, we have his name meaning God be praised. So, you know, if I look at a parent who names one child Smith, as in you're going to be a blacksmith like your father maybe, and one who names their child God be praised, obviously one's got their eyes on the Lord, one's got their eyes more on the world. That, that's what I'm seeing from this. And then we get to Yarad, Jared, descent, and that could be, you know, he was looking toward the descendant, looking to the greater one who would be in that descension who would be Messiah. But whatever it was, however it was, we know Enoch, Hanok, is a man of exemplary life. That his name, meaning dedication, he dedicated his life to the Lord. He had a very, very close walk with the Lord. And we will talk about that in just a moment. Let me say also, Lamech in Cain's line, that seventh generation, if Adam was the one writing this down, and it, it was given to Moshe, who took and put it all together, and he gets the credit because he, he, he's the one that really we, weaved it together. Um, and, of course, God's the author. But if Adam wrote chapter 4, then it shows us that Adam kept up with Cain's line. Even though Cain went out as a vagabond, Adam knew the descendants that came from Cain all the way to until Adam's death. It is very interesting that Cain's line is dropped when Adam dies. We don't see anyone else pick up that line. We've got it through Lamech, and we never know anything beyond Lamech. That doesn't mean that the line ended, but it isn't recorded for us. I think that the purpose of that is we don't have time to know everything in the scriptures. We couldn't begin to get through the book if we got everything given to us, so we have what's important. We have the fact that we need to look at the godly line. We need to follow the godly line, and we need to follow that example. So, uh, again, now when we pick up in verse 20, we're continuing along the line of Seth. We're continuing um, and finding out that Jared, the one that I mentioned, that gives birth to Enoch, is going to live 962 years. Again, a long life here still. So we read that, verse 20, Jared... Uh, yeah, so all the days of Jared, oh, let me start with 19 then. Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962, and he died. Remember, that's the repeating phrase in chapter 5, the frailty of man again in the physical, and he died, and he died, and he died. So Jared makes it to 962, but what's interesting is verse 23, we're going to see how long Enoch lived, his son, okay? So Enoch, verse 21, taking it in order, lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah in our English. Uh, let's see, Methuselah, Methuselah in Hebrew. A little bit of a tongue twister there, but... Um, um, Enoch fathers him at 62 years, which is about the average age, I think, with some of them, although we see one that, that fathered at 165 years, I think it was. So, um, so here he is at 62 years, he gives birth, and then instead of it telling us in the next, and he lived so many more years and he died, here's where our change comes in, verse 22. Then Enoch, Enoch walked with God, 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, okay, or Methuselah. So we have this one standing out. We have something about his life. What we have about his life is that he walked with God. He did have other sons and daughters, and we go to verse 23. All the days of Enoch, Hanuk, were 365 years. That's short. The others are living like 900 years. What happened to him at 365 years? 
Verse 24, Enoch Chinook walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That means that he wasn't found on the earth anymore. What we have in Enoch, which is exciting to us, is we have a picture of the rapture here. The rapture is not spelled out in detail in the original covenant, but we see a picture of it here. The church, the church age, the called out assembly that we're a part of now, we see in it that it is raptured, goes home to be with the Lord in its seventh generation. We have the seven churches in Revelation. We have that they cover periods of time. They are not covering the same periods of time. Even in scripture, the word generation can mean 40 years at one place. It can mean 70 at another. It can mean 100 at another. And when we talk about the generations of the church, we have it going from the first century at least to the 21st century AD because that's where we are now and it's not over. So you can't take the seven and divide it by 21. If you even did, you're going to see, well, wait a minute, that's long beyond 40, 70, or 100. So I'm not giving you how long a generation is. But when we look at this generation and then this generation, when we look at those seven churches and what happened that relates to that, we can see periods of time. When I taught the book of Revelation, I gave you those periods of time. I had them, and I didn't bring them down with me today. So if you're interested, I can repeat that. The next time we meet, I can bring that information to us. But just realize that it's not a matter of years, but we're going to go from a church called Ephesus all the way to a church called Laodicea. The last two churches that run simultaneously are the Philadelphia Church and the Laodicea Church. If you are in a church, you are in one of those two. If you're in a church that is on fire for the Lord, that is telling you, go out, take the word of God, be, be a missionary, sending missionaries, that's preaching the word of God and not tickling ears and telling you nice stories and how to be happy and, and what's going to make you successful, then you're in a Philadelphia church. That church is full of brotherly love is not lacking love, it is caring about reaching others. That's a good healthy church. That's the end of the church age that we will see that church go up in rapture when God says it's complete. The Laodicean church that runs alongside of it has some people in that church who must be saved, I believe there are, but and they're just in a in a very um, backslidden state, I'll put it that way. But I believe there's those sitting in those churches who think they're saved because they're sitting in those churches. And they're not. Their heart isn't right with, with the Lord. He, he condemns that church. He calls them out. He says, you're not hot. You're not cold. You're worthless. If you are hot, you're good for something. If you're cold, you're good for something. You're good for nothing. You think you're rich. You think that you've got great sight. You think that you're clothed beautifully. You don't realize that you're naked. You're blind. And you're, what's the third? Whatever, the opposite of the third. I lost my train of thought in there. But both of those are going on simultaneously. And if you have any question about where you are going, the litmus test is the Word of God and what they're doing with it. Are they teaching you to get into it, study it, have a prayer life, have a walk with God, get out, and take that out as a light to the nations? If they are, you're in a good place. Plug in and be a part. If you're not, get up and get out. <laughs> because God tells them to separate before the plagues fall, that they'll endure because they're not right with God. So when we see Enoch, we see he had that walk with God. He was right with God. He had a testimony. And he is, he's, he's taken up without going through physical death. That's why it doesn't say, and he died and God took him home. It says, and he was not. He just wasn't found. They never found his body. We have two examples of this in our original covenant. And it's Enoch and it's Elijah, Eliyahu who the, his servant Elisha, his, his co, you know, the one who was right under him being trained by him, saw uh, Eliyahu go in a chariot of fire swirling up into heaven. His mantle fell down on Elisha, who was to pick that mantle up, carry on the ministry, and God gave him a double portion to do so. So we see those two are the only two we read about in Scripture that are uh, um, taken out of this world without that physical death during our original covenant years. Enoch was not left on this earth to see the evil that was going to rise to a head. 
Um, we know that judgment is going to come because it gets so bad, every thought was only evil continually. Are we close to that? I absolutely believe it. Did you listen to the news last night that made me cry? We've got another shooting. We've got innocent children who lost their lives at school where they should have been safe, two teachers along with them, and our president on air saying, and this won't be our last, but why are we tolerating this? Why is this happening here? And I think because we're in the days like Noah. We're in the days that only evil is filling the heart of man continually. And if it is coming to that point, like we're seeing, we need to work fast and hard to reach anyone we care about with the message. You need to be right with the Lord. You need to have asked him into your heart as Savior so that you can be a part who goes in rapture and does not suffer what is coming on this earth. We think the pandemic was bad. We think these shootings are bad. Yes, they are. Any life lost, it's bad. But it's going to be compounded one on top of another, plague after plague, suffering after suffering. The people are going to wish they could die. They're going to cry out to die, and they can't even die. And then there'll be those who are dropping dead from, from um, the, all the, that transpires. It's a horrible time. More than that, if they don't get saved during that time, when they do leave this earth, they're putting themselves into an eternal suffering. If that doesn't light a fire into you about anybody the Lord puts in your path, then something's wrong with your heart because it should make you really motivated to share, share in a loving manner. No one wants somebody to hit them over the head with a billy club, but everybody loves to be loved. And let love open the door as you do those good works that your Father enables you to do so that they might see the love of the Father in you. That's our Heavenly Father. So um, that's just my little sermonette for the day, but take it to heart if you need to. And if you're there, praise the Lord, keep on going. Don't get weary in well-doing. Yes, Rhonda? It keeps being on my heart to say this. I think... If we can adopt the high schools and the elementary schools and the middle schools in our immediate area and just put it add it to our prayer list, That's a wonderful. I, believe, I believe that could change for each of us if we just adopt the schools in our area. At least we can know where there's a covering over them. Amen. Amen. That's a wonderful idea. I know there's mom's groups out there where the kids are attending that are doing it. But we don't need to be a mom and have a child in that school. If you know a name of a school in your area, adopt it right now. And if you don't know a name, it's easy to find out. Very easy. And yes, yes, I would pray for all of them, not even just one like Rhonda said. Good idea. And I think we should. These are precious little ones. So every life is precious, but you know what I'm saying. It just seems even worse when it, when it happens to a child. But back on sight of the beautiful... Enoch got to go home. He didn't have to endure and see what was coming. And that's a picture for us of the church being raptured before the tribulation. That we are going to have... She's trying to silence it. Okay, we're, we're, um, we're encouraged that the Lord has a beautiful plan for us to take us home to be with him before his wrath is poured out on this earth. Now, if just a human author wrote this book, I would think very much there'd be a curiosity factor here. Where'd he go? What happened? Why can't we find the body? And I think we'd have a whole headlines, you know, here's the stories, you know, how they even take a story on the news and they give you this angle, and then they come with somebody else giving you this angle, and then they find another way to give you that angle. But the only other angle, we have it all in Scripture we find in Hebrews 11. And I want to take you to that, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. And here we read, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. I think, wow, Lord, let me be like Enoch. 
let me be pleasing to you. I want to hear the Lord say that. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear, I'm pleased with you. I would love to go in rapture. Our, my family's motto, when we would depart from each other, to this day it carries on. My parents started it in their generation, is I'll see you here, there, or in the air. <laughs> we have that great hope that we could at any time be raptured up, but I want my life until I am raptured up, or until I leave this earth as God ordains best, where God can say my life was pleasing to Him. That makes Enoch stand out. We know others. God says it about others. He calls Moshe a friend of God. He calls David that. He calls Abraham that. I've also asked for that. He said, Lord, work in me and make me the character that you can say, I'm your friend and I please you. That's, wow. That I hear those words, you'll see me do a million backflips <laughs> because that's what I want. And I see this in Enoch as we go back to, whoops, back to Genesis. I see that, that he had a mysterious disappearance, but it was not because something happened to him. It was because God took him home. It says in our, in our scripture earlier, the verse earlier, I think it was verse 22. I'm looking real fast. I have to scroll back down to it. Yes, verse 22, the key is, he walked with God 300 years. Now, that walking, when we look at the root word for the meaning for walking, that's a walking in agreement. That's not just two people walking down a path, but they're in agreement. They're in sympathy, uh, uh, sympathy with each other. Um, and I don't mean they're crying for each other, but you know they have that, that like heart with each other. They're in harmony. They're in fellowship. There's an amity there. There's a friendship. There's an intimacy. There is a love there. That's what is being um, held up to us. This is what Enoch had with his God. Uh, I'm going to look at Amos 3 and verse 3. Amos, whoops, 3 and verse 3. Oh good, I got my tablet back. I'm, for whatever reason, I'm not punching where I think I am. There we go. This time my tablet took it. Amos 3 and verse 3, we read, and I ask you, you know, can we raise up to that today? Are we able? Well, Enoch did. And Amos 3, 3 says, do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Or in other words, unless they have agreed together to walk together. When two marry, they're agreeing to walk together. If they are faithful to their vows, they walk together from that point forward. They don't separate. They don't pull apart. If you've ever tried to walk favoring one leg, you can hobble along, but you don't walk the smooth gait as two that are equal. And in this, we need to be where we are in that unity with the Lord, that we are walking with Him, not pulling away from Him, not tugging, not stumbling, but just that walk with Him. How do we have that kind of walk? First of all, it's by our faith. It is not by anything that we muster up on ourselves. I am literally worthless in my flesh, and I know it. Trust me. I'm reminded of that daily. I'm reminded of that constantly. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 says to us, For we walk by faith, not by sight. That means that, that we're not constantly questioning and trying to run the ship ourselves. We're walking by our faith in our God. If we put our life into His, and we're walking with Him, He's the lead. We're really just following along with Him in that sync with Him. We're walking in the light He gives us. He doesn't leave us in the dark. He doesn't make you feel like you're going to, wait a minute, I can't see, I'm, I'm stumbling. No. If we're walking in our faith, we have eyes to see that are not physical. We have ears to hear that are not physical. We're walking in our senses spiritually. And this is what we're invited to do. Look at 1 John, 1 Yochanan. Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1, whoops, okay. I'm not doing good with my tablet today. <laughs> and it's me, it's not my tablet, but it's me. Okay, let me try that again, 1 John. I apologize for the delay. First John chapter 1, and we are going to look at verses 5 through 7. And here we read, This is the message we've heard from him, from the Lord, 
and announced to you. So Yochanan, John, who was his beloved Talmud, his beloved follower, his t disciple, who, who had an intimate relationship with the Lord. He's the one that's, that's writing. He says, we've heard from the Lord, and we announce to you, God is light. If you think you're in the dark, you need to get into the clinging to the Lord, because in Him there is no darkness at all. When I go on to verse 6, it says, if we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie, and we don't practice the truth. And this is those who say, but don't do what they're saying. We all know people that are like that. They even give us a bad testimony because they'll say, oh, I'm Christian, quote, and then they do something to the contrary. But if we're walking in that light, verse 7, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's our secret. That was Enoch's foundation, was walking with God. So he was walking in the light of the Lord, he was walking by faith in the Lord, and the Lord cleansed him so that he could have a life that God could say is pleasing to me. Without faith it's impossible to please God. The scriptures tell us that also. But Enoch had that faith, he had that walk, he walked with God. It says that he walked with God after his son was born. We don't know what was going on before. Maybe he did, but he developed a greater walk. Maybe when he came into that relationship of a father to a son, he realized on a greater level. I don't know. But at least 300 years, he walked in fellowship, in harmony, in unity, in, in a deep intimacy with the Lord. And wow, can you imagine? Um, the Spurgeon said, Enoch walked with God after Methuselah had been born 300 years, and doubtless he'd walked with him before. What a splendid walk. And I think, wow, a walk of 300 years. Now Spurgeon went on to say, and I'll agree with him, if you walked in somebody's company that anybody other than the Lord, I don't think you'd want to walk with them 300 <laughs> years. <laughs> we'd get tired, we'd get bored, we'd want somebody else or something. But here, it, the, the company was so sweet. The, the, I can only imagine the, the conversations between them that this patriarch kept walking with the Lord. And I believe he probably spent more and more and more time with the Lord. That that just consumed him, his, his very whole being, until he had finally, and as Spurgeon said, walked beyond time and space and walked right into paradise. However God did it, I heard another one once say that God and Enoch were taking one of their long walks, and God looked at Enoch and said, you know, you're closer to my home than you are to your home. Let's go home today together, and took him on the rest of the way. However it was, it was beautiful. And as God just ushered him into the presence of, of his place for Enoch forever, wow. What a life, and what an example for us, and where we should be striving that we don't desire anything of this world. We don't desire fellowship of anything else. Does that mean separate yourself from your, your loved ones? No, no. But let's take them on the journey together because there's sweet fellowship. When believers get together, you feel the unity in the spirit. There's sweetness in that fellowship. Let's encourage everyone to be walking that kind of walk with Enoch. And if we see a weakness in a brother, we're not there to point the finger, but then we'd be there to help pull them up. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one, because if one falls, the other's there to pull them up. So that's where we should be in that kind of a walk. And the, the contrast, let me take you just in reminder on our way back to Genesis 5, go all the way back to Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we're going to look real quick at verse 8. Genesis 3 and verse 8. We have here, this is Adam and Eve, Chava. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. What a contrast. Enoch denied himself from God's presence. He was walking with them, talking with them, thinking with them, following him, being led by him, and pouring out everything that God was pouring into him, I'm sure. But here is where sin separated Adam and Eve, and they even hid from God. Um, now, there was reconciliation for Adam and Eve. Wherever you're at, whenever there's a need, there is reconciliation. We don't live perfectly, but 
we do have the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit within us, to live that kind of a life. And I say, do it in me, Lord. Do it in me, Lord. I can't, but I give you carte blanche. Do it in me. Do it in me. Now, the very fact that we have that God took him also tells us something else very important. For all those who want to believe that this is it, when you die, it's done and it's over, then it couldn't be phrased that way. But if God took him, it's showing there is existence. There is life after this earth. If his body had been found, somebody would have found it, they would have hollered and they would have said that we know that there is a life after we slip out of this body, we, we slip into eternity, and there is life that goes on. What God breathed into um, Adam and became a living soul cannot die. That does not stop. That's the spirit that lives on. In Jude, the book, the Yud is actually in the Hebrew, the book just before Revelation, it also talks about Enoch, and it says it was, also, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with many thousands of his holy ones. Or actually, the tense in there is the Lord came, because even though he's speaking prophetically, he's speaking with that voice that's saying it's completed. Because anything God's prophesied, is already completed. It's as good as completed because God is faithful to his word. And God sees the end from the beginning. So it's like that rose break. You're seeing it start, but if you were up looking at God's view, you see the end. Okay, so that's how it's meaning it. Enoch preached. He prophesied. That was the result of his walking with God. How did Enoch know that the Lord is going to return with 10,000s of his saints? Were there 10,000 people on the face of the earth by this point? I don't know. They were populating quickly, we looked at that, but to think that there were going to be all these people coming back with the Lord, how could Enoch know something like that at his time that he was on this earth? I believe God told him. I believe that God was telling him the whole prophetic plan. I think that he, he was privy to God's future. And the way we drink up and get excited over when we see God tell us prophetically things that are going to happen, I can imagine the joy of Enoch as he just ate up everywhere God shared with him. And so he also spoke in verse 15, and I need to call it 15 in mind, so give me just a moment. But uh, he also spoke about the opposite, this ungodly line. He said that the, the Lord's going to come. He's going to come. Here's his reason why. Verse 15, to execute judgment upon all. Convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. Are you getting the idea? This is pretty simple. Ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God's judgment, that wrath, falls on the ungodly. He doesn't have his wrath fall on his children. He may child train you. He may correct you. But that kind of wrath falls on the ungodly. And they are deserving of it because of their deeds. Maybe Enoch even had Lamech in mind, who's lived an ungodly life, who's killed others, and, and is boasting about it. I don't know. But it, it could have been that that was even what was in his mind. Now, this prophecy that Enoch tells us, he knew, it's also written in the book called the Book of Enoch. And you may have heard of it or you may hear of it in some time. It is one of the books that was rejected from being in the canon of Scripture, which means that there was criteria that each book had to meet for it to be declared fully inerrant, fully the Word of God. There are books that, that are very good history, but they didn't reach that inerrant level. There, were, there was a, a whole criteria they had to meet, from the author to um, other circumstances. I can't remember it all now. But the Book of Enoch did not meet that level. That means that you can read that book, and you can look at it as a good book. You can learn maybe history from it. You can learn other things from it, but you can't take every word in it like we can the Word of God, the Bible. We can't know that every single word is 100% truth, no inerrancy, no, you know, nothing, nothing wrong. So even though we use his name, and his name is associated with a book, we need to stick with what, what I believe God ordained to bring down to us as a Bible when we put it on that inerrant level. 
The scriptures tell us don't add to and don't take away. So I believe that we can look at these other books only as maybe a good history book or a good book to give us some thoughts. But it, I cannot look at it that this is God's word that he dictated to the one who wrote. Now, it's also very interesting that there are those who want to say, well, Jude quoted from the book of Enoch, so it's got to be good. Well, I'll tell you two things. One, some of the book of Enoch could be a very good and a very right-on teaching. But how do you know that the book of Enoch preceded Jude's comment? Maybe the book of Enoch is quoting Jude rather than Jude quoting the book of Enoch. And we can't tell because we don't know timing in that because we're giving it to us in the book of Jude. We're not giving it from Enoch saying it. But on the basis of how early Enoch lived and on the basis of where our writings come from, I have a feeling very easily that the book of Enoch quoted Enoch and not the other way around. But even if so, I can read the book of Maccabees. That's books, two books that were also knocked out. They're part of what's called the apocryphal books. Those books give me Jewish history. They help me know the story of Hanukkah. I can appreciate that from a historical viewpoint, but I don't say it's inerrant. I don't say it's something I can stake my life on and take to all the way to heaven with me. I also want to throw out for you this interesting question because of our study previous to the book of Genesis. Did God walk with Enoch in the nighttime and show him that gospel in the stars. Was that how he knew some of these things? Because we know what they learned from the gospel in the stars far exceeded what, what, what others would have known. That was the wisdom that God gave them. So, we'll ask Enoch one day, how did you get your wisdom? Did God just tell you? Or did God show you? We'll find out. Doesn't matter, we know it's truth. Okay? So, it is also interesting to notice when we're back in Genesis 5 that Jared, um, in verse 20, it gives us, okay, there we go, I'm back in, uh, Jared in verse 20, we have that he lived 962 years, okay, and he lived 800 of those years after Enoch was born. So, when we look at this, Enoch's father lived 435 years after his son went home to be with the Lord. You know, just interesting side notes. If you didn't follow that, I can spell it out. Jared's 162 when Enoch is born. Enoch lives 365 years. That makes Jared 527 when Enoch's earthly life ended. And Jared goes on 435 years beyond that because he doesn't die till he's 962. So we have, you know, all these time, I mean, who knows how much and what took place during those times, but we have everything we need to know written right here for our edification. So when we go on back in Genesis, we have, uh, we've covered how Enoch worked, I mean, walked with God, I'm sorry. He is the father of Methuselah, Methuselah, and there are ancient commentators, the, the, uh, there are others who say different, but the, the ancient ones say that the Hebrew root meanings out of, out of his name means when he is dead, it shall be. Another mean, says it means sending forth, that there is something coming that will happen when this one dies. If that's true, then even in that, we can see that God gave Enoch the revelation of the judgment that would come after Methuselah's death. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the coming judgment of Noah's flood. That, you know, remember we're getting close to the time of Noah and we're going to go through the, the judgment of the flood on the face of the earth. So it could be, and we believe it probably is referring to that judgment if we are understanding his name accurately. And when you remember Enoch and God walked and talked 300 years, there was plenty of time for God to reveal things to him. Plenty of time that he could have had that revelation. Now what is interesting is Methuselah, we'll read here, that he was 187 when he became the father of Lamech, and this is a different Lamech. They use same names, like we've got lots of Davids today, and, you know, they used the same names too. So he lived um, 187 years when he became a father, and then he lived 782 years after that, had other sons and daughters. 27, verse 27 tells us 
He was 969 years old when he died. He lived the longest. When you're in a, a contest, you know, to, to know the answers, remember Methuselah is the one who lived the longest, 969 years. What's so interesting about that? If it is that even his very name was a warning of this coming judgment, then we see again God's long suffering, God's patience. He wasn't willing to bring judgment on the people until that cup of iniquity was so full he could no longer hold back. So it shows that he is willing again that not any perish and that he went the longest possible because if God was saying this one has just been born, the judgment will come when he dies and then he gives him the longest life out of anybody, it shows I see God holding back judgment as long as he possibly can. I think that's where we're at right now. The judgment of the tribulation is being held back out of that willingness on God's part that not any perish. Those who get saved between today and when that judgment comes are the ones I'm talking about, that God held back bringing it, knowing there would be more who would get saved. That fits with us knowing that when does the church age end? It ends when the body of Messiah is complete, when that last one who is going to get saved in that period of time, not the last one ever saved. There were people saved before the church age. There will be people saved after the church age. But that is the, the one that, I mean, that's what we're waiting for in essence, is that last one to come in when that body is complete. Then we go home and God's program continues on and that judgment will come. Um, let me show you 2 Peter 3, 9. Whoops, I don't want to do it there. I want to do it here. 2 Peter 3, 9. And stay back there with me for a minute because we're going to go, I think, to 1 Peter next. Yes. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where we read, The Lord is not slow about His promises. Some count slowness, but He's patient <coughs> toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. What does that mean? That when we're crying out saying, Lord, how long? How much more do we have to endure? How much more evil do we have to see? How many more reports do we have to get like the news last night? Come on, Lord, get us out of here. When you're in the midst of the, the sin, when you just feel like you are, are walking through the cesspool of this life, you're crying out, Lord, Get me out of here. How long? That's what you're saying in essence. What's taking you so long, Lord? <laughs> now, we don't mean any disrespect, and God understands that, but in essence, that's what we're saying. And God's saying, <clears throat> I waited long enough for you to get saved. I'm waiting long enough because this one will get saved. Isn't it worth you waiting and being patient a little bit longer that this one can add the joy of their salvation also? And you have to throw up your hands and say, okay, God, okay, I get it. But should we hurry up and get the witness out so we can get that last one saved? Yes. You want him to come sooner? Go work for him, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Go do what you can. You never know. You might be the one to reach that last one, and boom, we go. So, okay, you get both sides. Back up with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. And in 1st Kepha, 1st Peter 3 and verse 20, we also read, Who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. We're taking a quick snapshot through to chapter 9 and following um, well, chapter 9, especially in Genesis, what we're, what's being referred to here is the people were disobedient. The people were ungodly. The people are living a sinful life. Yet God patiently waited. He didn't just snap his fingers one day and say, this is it, here's the judgment. No. He called, he called up Noah and he told him, build an ark. Tell the people. Now, they'd never seen rain. They didn't know what rain was. They didn't live near an ocean where you've got a cruise liner that's big. You know, this is a monstrosity that's being built for something called, what, rain? I mean, this was nothing they knew. But the whole time Noah's building this ark, and it takes him 120 years, he's preaching that there's a coming judgment, that you need to get right with God to escape that judgment. And out of that time, 
when the last one that was a believer outside of Noah's family, and that's Methuselah when he dies, then the family goes on to the ark or is in the ark when Methuselah dies. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, but then that's all that were saved. Everyone that was a believer went into the ark. There were eight people and they were in one family. That's sad. Right now I can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I've got at least 13 families, and I'm quitting counting there, that have at least someone with the testimony. I've got so much more than Noah had. And how sad. But God waited till it came down to that, and then he kept his believing family safe when the judgment came. Rhonda? You said that uh, they didn't know about rain. Right. Why, 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 how do we know that? Like, why is that the case? It's in Bereshit. It's in Genesis. We will come to that. Um, I don't know if I can find it fast. Let me see. Um, let me go to Genesis. I'm not sure if it's in 9 or if it's between 6 and 9. If I can't find it fast for sake of time, I'll come back with it. Okay. Um, oh, it might, even, it might be in Hebrews. It may be in Hebrews. Let me try Hebrews. Um, this on, on the land. What? There was a mist upon the land. That's it. Yeah, the, the mist was the, how God watered the land. Um, that it wasn't by our cycle of rain like we have now. Let me try Hebrews 11 because I think it might be there. Uh, yeah. When we get down to where it talks about Noah. And I'm, I'm looking quickly. Did I already pass it? If I did, then it's not in. I, by faith, here we go. Yeah, here we go. It's Hebrews 11, 7. Thank you for your question, and thank you, Lord, for the answer. By, thank you. Yes, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. And you could say, well, no one had seen that kind of judgment, but when we study what happened, the, the canopy around the earth that is broken up by the rain, we see it in evidence of the shortening of lives. Why I'm telling you now they're living 900, and they're not going to live 900 later. When we go into all that, we realize that this canopy was refreshing the earth, was like the dew and the mist and, and the, the watering of the earth. And when that's broken up, there is a new cycle that is taking place now, which is what we know, where the clouds get seeded and the rain comes. But they didn't know of that before. They'd never even seen. They probably never saw a cloud. They, I don't know what they would see of the canopy, but I, I, I don't think they saw clouds in the way we see clouds. Now, don't quote me on that, because I can't tell you that. You know, but they definitely didn't know what rain was and weren't accustomed to that. Um, you know, watering their land for them. Maybe it was like the rainforest that's all green and it rains or whatever. But that is oh, actual so rain. But, but yeah, it would have been taken care of in, in a sense in that way. I can see where you're going. Genesis 2, 5, and 6. Which says, is that the mist coming up? Yeah. 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 yeah in the Garden of Eden we know how it was, but there's no reason to believe that wasn't on the whole face of the earth. So yeah, go ahead and read it, Roger. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. There you go. And there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist used to rise up from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Okay, so very good. What verse is that? There. Genesis what 2, verse? Genesis 2, 5, and 6. Genesis 2, verses 5 through 6. So there's our double proof out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let a thing be established. So, and yeah. And the, the Hebrew word translated as rain is matar, matar. which okay. the verb refers to falling condensed water, okay. not mist. Not mist, okay. Okay, so it's making it different than the word used for that yeah. mist. Because I was reading NASB. Okay, two different Hebrew words. And when we get to that, um, obviously I didn't do it in Genesis 2 unless we've all forgotten, which could be. But when we get to that, I will research it in the Hebrew words and bring you that also again so that we get that full understanding. That's why I love the, the Hebrew and the Greek because there's so much more in that. Um, I was just taught today, Joshua continues on from Deuteronomy because in the Hebrew it says, and, which like the, the well it was <coughs> Dr. McGee, he's a great Bible teacher with the Lord, but his, his 
um, through the Bible in five years. It's on the radio, it's online, it's in print, it's a great way to study the Bible. Anyway, he said, um, as soon as a preacher says the word and, he has to keep talking because he's <laughs> connecting two things. And that's what was happening here, and it shows the flow that goes because you have it going from Moshe, who is law, into Joshua, who is the name for Yeshua, Jesus, who is grace. That they could not enter into the promised land through law, but they could through grace. That's a picture for us also. And this is a great note and a great place, even though it's short for today. I'm going to apologize for that. But I will tie it up here for today because we're going to look at the character of Noah. We're going to see what his name means in relation to the world around him. Does his name reflect it, like we're saying the name of Methuselah reflected his, Enoch reflected his. What are we going to see that, that made Noah stand out, stand different? We'll get a sneak peek. We'll get more when we get to the time where we, we study him. But next time when we meet, and I believe for sake of those on video, it, it looks like it may be two weeks before we come back. So we may be into June when we come back. Um, just stay tuned for those of you who, who do it live with me. But we'll look at the cursing of the ground. We'll look at Noah. Um, I'll throw you out a thought question right now. Some of you maybe ahead know the answer. If so, shh, let the others work on it. But Noah had three sons. Were they triplets or were they born separately? And whichever answer you come up with, back it up with the Word of God. Okay, that's your homework. That's just for fun because it's not um, earth shattering. But there is evidence for one answer or the other in scripture, very clear evidence. But you might need to do a little digging to find it out. So we'll look at all of that. We'll get into um, uh, what happened before the flood, building up to the flood. And we'll look one more time. We'll finish up probably the genealogies next week. But I'll give you a summary of what, what I call nuggets from the genealogy that will just tell us these different things that just, they're just, they help us connect it all. The first one, just to tease you, Adam was 687 years old when Methuselah was born. So here we are down the line studying Methuselah. It's taken us so long to get to him that we've left Adam in the dust. Uh-uh. Adam was alive and well on the face of this earth when Methuselah was born. So... It just, you know, food for thought, interesting things, help us see a whole and a complete picture. Um, we will talk about the timing of Noah going into the ark, and then we will get into chapter 6. And if you don't know the controversy in chapter 6, hang on. We'll probably have a lot of lively discussion in, in that because there's two main schools of thought for chapter 6. If you don't know what I'm talking about, do your homework. You've got two weeks. Okay, all these people that are having all this... Are they brothers? They would like like Seth had so and so, and the other guy said. And they would be grandfather, son, or grandfather. Well, how do I put this? Okay, Adam had Seth. Seth had um, Enoch, wasn't it? I just did this. Yeah, Enosh. Enosh. Enoch. Okay, yeah. so Enosh is Adam's grandson. So we're following one family line through Seth. But it's father to son to son to son to oh, son. Okay. So yeah. when you get down to that seventh one, when you get to Enoch who went home to be with the Lord, he would be, Adam would be his great, 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 great grandfather. Mm. Okay? So it's all in that one family. <clears throat> so y'all want to do your family tree. You want to find a few prized people in your tree. You don't want to find you know, the traitors and the murderers, you want to find the good people. Well, Enoch could draw all the way back to Adam in the godly line that had Seth, where in Cain's line, Lamech, who was ungodly, his great, 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 great grandfather was Cain. So, you know, so Cain's line showed his family and Adam, Seth, and down through Enoch is the other family. We've got like the godly family and the ungodly family. Okay? Go ahead. When I was reading that, were Ham, Shem, and Japheth triplets? Don't you answer it. No, I won't it. say it, but okay. it says that. That's <laughs> been, Googled. That's been viewed 20,000 times. 
in, in, in the last seven years, people trying to find that answer. Okay, I'm not original then. He <laughs> says that that site was that asked that question has had 20,000 hits in the last seven years asking were they triplets or not. <laughs> well, they give a good, so, yeah, I like it. I don't know what site you went to. I can tell you a good site to go to, but I want y'all to do your homework. <laughs> if you need help, I'm here. <laughs> but I want you to do your homework. Okay, questions, comments? Okay, again, I appreciate you understanding why class is a little shorter today um, because I do need to take care of the family needs for what is going on. We don't stop um, you can, you can shut it down. Well, let's close in prayer and then we'll, we'll say it. We can open up to discussion. But uh, it is that I need to deal with other, other issues. So apologies to whosoever. Maybe it's great. Maybe y'all think I go too long. This is the one time teacher short <laughs> or shorter I'm short every day I know even if it makes me look long I know <laughs> but that's okay short and light flies faster so I'll wave to y'all as I go by I'm on my way up being raptured let's pray <laughs> Lord God thank you that you are faithful faithful to your word thank you that we can learn and glean from those who went before us Lord let us have a heart like Enoch's let us want to walk with you, talk with you, hear you, listen to you, have the revelation that you give to each one of us individually because you speak to us. Lord, let us be so content in that, that nothing of this earth can take our sight away from you and that we'll live a life exemplary that we will be enticing to this outside world that does not know you. Lord, they need you. This world is so difficult with you we make it without you i don't know how any do so let us let our lights so shine that we can be a pointer to you and to the way to go home to be with you forever when they leave this earth also thank you that we are sure of our promises as sure as enough was that you would return with ten thousands of your saints we know it to be true lord and we thank you that faithful is our god who will keep every word of, that he has promised Lord, we give you our praise. We give you our adoration. We give you our, our undying. We want to live it for you, Lord. And we thank you that you'll take and mold and make us because we can't do it ourselves. But by virtue of your Ruch HaKodesh within us, and we thank you for him, for the Holy Spirit, let it be so. In your holy name, amen. Amen.